and John Thompson were talking about yesterday, 30 years ago, that we can study plants from space. And then he went on to create 30 years of uh, Earth observations, that the well-known and one and only GIMS data set that everybody uses. And let us welcome him from Turkey, where he's doing some archaeological work, and, and, and let us tell, uh, tell us in his own words you know, how he accomplished that. Take it away, Jim. Thank you very much, Ronald. Um, so I've been asked to talk about how I bumbled into using time series data, uh, time series remote sensing data, and that, and that is what I'll try and do. Uh, but first, I want to show this really graphic image, which Gene Feldman of the CMS Project has produced. It's a normalized difference vegetation index combined with uh, with ocean color data from the ocean, it's where you look for the density. The respective scales for both that are on the bottom of the image. It uses sea data from 1997 through 2011. And the process, you can completely obliterate clouds. So you have a rendition of, of the average chlorophyll density of the surface of the land and also for the oceans. And for me, it's really cool looking at the oceans because I know so little about them. Where you have those blue areas in the oceans, you actually have biological deserts. Uh, anyway, so with Earth observations data, we can do all kinds of things. When I give talks to people, uh, and they hear I'm from NASA, sometimes people say, we didn't realize NASA studied the Earth. Uh, and so I show this slide, and so within NASA, there are engineers who build instruments, so uh, they fly them into space, some of them look away from the Earth to study things about astronomy, various aspects of astronomy. The same engineers build nominal instruments to look down at the Earth, and that's what all of us use for our science. And with us, I like the most sensitive, we would be just bumbling along because they provide daily data, weekly data, fantastic data of the atmosphere, the oceans, and the land, and this enables us to treat Earth system science quantitatively. So um, I have this in just to show that. Many people are not aware of it, but, but uh, a very large percentage of the uh, spectral solar irradiance is in the visible region of the spectrum. This is undoubtedly why we see it the visible, this is from what the energy is. Uh, and this is also where photosynthesis occurs. So it's a complex figure. It shows the distribution of, uh, of energy from the sun, of the, uh, of the solar spectral irradiance top of the atmosphere. And then what actually propagates through to the surface, visible portion is delineated uh, with the spectrum blue, green, yellow, and red. And there's a picture of the atmospheric limb, which Dr. Sellers talked about, which Pierce talked about, this very thin layer of uh, 25, 30, 35 miles of atmosphere on our planet. And then in between those two curves, where we have these black and white areas with uh, respective wavelengths, we have what we have atmospheric windows. So this is just to set the stage that in remote sensing, all of us use satellite data. We look in, in passive parts of the spectrum where we have reflectance or emitted energy. We also use active devices like lasers uh, and also the radar to study the Earth. But it's that we can use all these different wavelengths, which enable us to do the wonderful job of doing it. Uh, so how did all this start? Well, I kind of bumbled into most sensitive because I had, when I finished my undergraduate degree at Colorado State University in Fort Collins in biology, I couldn't find a job, so I got a job in a bank at Colorado National Bank in Denver, and then later at First National Bank in Albuquerque, New Mexico, but I really hated banking. I, I just wasn't made for it. And so this, this drove me back to Fort Collins, Colorado, into graduate school, and I ended up being sort of a walk-in person in a project uh, on the short grass prairie of Colorado in the grassland biome of the U.S. International Biological Program, studying uh, primary production. And because I was a biologist, I was in charge of this. I was working with two very clever people, Lee D. Miller, also Bob Pearson, Bob Pearson's a white shirt. One of the person punched over um, with the longer hair and, uh, and the horn rimmed glasses. And I was in charge of clipping, and uh, we were working in a grassland system, so the total biomass production, uh, because it is herbaceous, is what is there. And once you've clipped a few areas, you want to find out 
better ways of doing it because it's a pain in the neck and it's time consuming and pretty laborious. But we've collected high respectful data and we also then struck the sampled areas that were one quarter square meter in a circular area like you see here. And it was my job as the biologist in the group to analyze these data. So again, these were high respectful data. We had data of every five nanometers from near ultraviolet out into the reflected infrared. Uh, here is just one of the figures. And it became readily apparent to me that there is a very high correlation in high perspectral data between adjacent wavelengths in broad regions of the spectrum and biological or physiological properties of vegetation. So this is a plot where I was looking at our square values as a function of wavelength between the spectral reflectivity at five nanometers versus the leaf water content Millennium fire content is a very easy way to tell what portion of the green vegetation you clip is live or dead. Because there's, there's very little water or no water in dead vegetation. So this figure shows that you have very high correlation it's in the red region of the spectrum. The spectrum is on the scale and also the nearby infrared. And these were two wavelength regions where you had different processes, absorption in the red and no absorption in the infrared, which were very close together spectrally. So we decided to build a simple instrument to go out and exploit those on the ground, a simple NL two-channel radiometer. At the same time, it's really crucial in any work you do to investigate simulation modeling. And I was in a class on simulation modeling, and I adapted a, a Markov chain approach to look at spectral reflectance, spectral absorption, and spectral transmission of the leak as a function of wavelength driven by absorption and scattering, 215 wavelengths from near ultraviolet into the water absorption region of the infrared. And by doing this, this confirmed what we were trying to measure. If you could put these quantities into a simulation context, and you would get out of the measure of the initial lead. And so it's very important to not only perform field experiments, but to do simulation modeling. And I've been putting a lot of them. Now, it's also really important when you do work to write it and publish it. And I'll make that point here because um, the, the two people I worked with who were the engineers in the project left the project to work in other areas when I was when I would just finished my master's degree. So I was abandoned and sort of an orphan graduate student. And they didn't write up some of their engineering work. So I told them because I had collected some of the data they used and analyzed some of the data they used to demonstrate their techniques. But I'd be very happy to write this up. I would put myself as the most junior author just to get the work out in the public domain. And so one of the things I did was I collected some more data for this two channel radiometer that I'm holding here and published it in applied optics. Well, then people started writing into me. Uh, uh, before we had email, people would write to you and, and they would say, why don't you come and bring this two channel radiometer? We would like to test it in our locations. By this time, I was a postdoctoral fellow. And I thought, wow, this will be a great way to travel places like Iceland, places in the UK, maybe the south of France, and Sweden. Um, so one summer, I did that. And working in Iceland, this is a photograph of me in Iceland, I discovered that the normalized difference vegetation index was very robust under different elimination conditions. And it dawned on me that maybe this could actually be used in a practical situation. Um, and the data actually held together very, very well. So that was what first thought on me from, from field work that spectral measurements can be very useful under different types of conditions. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, then when I got back to the Goddard Space Flight Center, my postdoc, uh, Brent Holman and I decided to do an experiment where we took frequent red and near infrared normalized diverse vegetation index measurements of a winter wheat area. This is a picture of when we had our winter wheat biomass and grain harvest. We made these measurements every four or five days over the growing season. Uh, and we found when we summed those that we could explain about 80% of the above ground biomass accumulation. And this is a very narrow range experiment. The same time density, the same microclimate, uh, um, this is an area of the, the areas which we had in this experiment were in a field were probably 40 by 60 meters, something like that. So then my branch head at the time, Charles Tesler, said, well, look, this is NASA. Figure out some way to do this with satellites. 
So we published this work um, in 1980, 1981. Um, and um, in looking around for the paper we wrote on it, the only possibility to do this was to employ this from the uh, from the NOAA Advanced Very High Resolution Radiometer, which was going to be launched in uh, in uh, an afternoon orbit in in early July of 1981, because it had two channels, which might be used. But one of the problems initially was these two channels overlap. Channel one not only included the upper part of the visible, but it included part of the near infrared, so it would have been useless. So. I went over to NOAA and talked to Stanley Schneider and Dave McGinnis and said, look, there are some very good vegetation reasons to split uh, these two channels so they don't overlap. And for snow reasons, they were interested in doing the same thing, so those two arguments carried the day. And so NOAA then split the channels so that the channel 1 and the channel 2 of the advanced very high resolution radiometers, which are not advanced, so they're not very high resolution, were not overlapping. And this is what has enabled everything. So then uh, that was done, and, and so we were sort of waiting on the personnel satellite to go up. But in the meantime, a group in northern Senegal, by Charlie Von Prat, a Belgian friend of mine, uh, was trying to estimate herbaceous biomass in one of the grasslands of the Sahelian region, in the northern part of Senegal, in an area that was uh, um, several hundred kilometers by several hundred kilometers. So I went over with my hand already on there, and I also put in a request to NOAA to get 3.1 kilometer coverage from NOAA 7, which had just been launched uh, and was turned on for data collection on the 1st of July of 1981. Um, we started a field experiment there. Now, what we were able to do, and I'll show in a second, we were able to confirm that you could do or you could perform total dry mass, total dry matter accumulation measurements from space. Uh, and uh, but one of the really cool things about what we're working is Hillian Zone is there because you have no mountains in the western part of Africa, uh, you have a precipitation gradient that is fairly constant to do lines of equal latitude as you go across the continent. And you have a gradient that is about one millimeter of precipitation per year per kilometer in the north south direction. So it's a perfect place to report because you're working along with a gradient in this monsoonal system. Now, uh, perhaps some of you aren't familiar with what it looks like in the Italian zone. There are marked, marked differences between the rainy season on the right, things are green, and the nine or ten month dry season on the left when it's dry. This is the same location. These are pictures taken by Greg Tappan. Uh, and it shows uh, uh, this area. There's some background noise here because I'm in the garage. Uh, I just walked you off the sideline. <laughs> anyway, so there, so there are marked differences between the rainy season on the right and the dry season on the left. There are even uh, perhaps more pronounced differences between or among years. So 1984, which was one of the years in our experiment working there, turned out to be the driest year of the century. We're just lucky to catch it. Here's a picture of uh, how dry it was in the Stillian zone. I draw your attention to the fence line uh, on the left-hand side of this image. Uh, and then here's the same time of year. This is the 1st of August, uh, 1994, uh, the same time as the previous image, when you know, it's a very wet year. Uh, and it's extremely wet. It's, you can see all the herbaceous material. So this is how rapidly things can change. I hope this noise ends soon. Uh, but I, anyway, okay, so when you do field work, you have all kinds of problems. We became the socials of the movement for lots of people. Here we're broken down because the car we were driving across the scaling zone, the grass in one year or one place was very high, and it, it blocked the air flow through the radiator, or the car overheated. So all the local people came out from the pipelines. <laughs> From the first series of data. Now, one of the problems with this set of data is you have to go out reading one kilometer data. So, we had to try and sample, we get destructively sampled biomass information uh, from areas that were one kilometer by one kilometer. Uh, and to do that, we had to go out with a group of people at the end of the growing season and sample lots of areas. 
Well, it was really, really laborious, and we employed a lot of people doing it. But after three years, here are all the data we collected uh, from, the, from one kilometer data on the x-axis, and then the end of the season total dry above ground biomass on the y-axis. And we explained 69% or 70% of the variation. So here we confirm that we have measured on the ground with animal instruments at a meter by meter scale. So then we realized that, wow, we can do all kinds of really cool things with aviation R data. Uh, and besides, is all we have at the time. But it also indicated how important time domain is. Spectral domain is important, the spatial domain is important, but the temporal domain is important. It just depends upon what you're looking at. Now I'm going to jump to something more current, and that is some work I've been doing with the co-workers of mine that went to Alaska. Did it most play this on the first to put our data set together. Uh, I'm in the lower right hand corner of this picture. Someone made an avatar from the front part of a national reference. <laughs> and they put a lunar on my shoulder and they dressed me up in a pure solar spacesuit. <laughs> Also, how he has time from the University of Virginia, and then uh, uh, very much co worker from the University of Alaska, Bob Margaritos, Skip Walker, and the Bob. And then there's also Joey Camisa, who's one of our sea uh, ice people who got our space telescope. So, we're studying tundra photosynthesis, tundra total granular accumulation. But for now, the 98 1, 1992, through a pretty present. We know the temperatures are, are differentially warm in the planet and are more pronounced in terms of anomalies at higher northern latitudes. The left hand plot uh, from NASA GIS shows the northern latitudes uh, from 1900 through 2010 or 2011 from uh, 23.6 north up to the North Pole, 90 degrees north. And then on the right hand slide, you have the same day of water. And you notice at the top of it, you have a lot of red colors. That makes it warmer there. So one of the cool things about the tundra is that it's very flat, fairly homogeneous, and so it's easy to collect data uh, in areas which are very similar. This is what Skip Walker, who's on the ground right now in the purple shirt, and his team are doing. They're collecting lots of biomass data. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, so what we have, is we don't have many areas where we have biomass data. We have several of them in North America and several of them in Russia and we have molecules of them. Those data are plotted on the left and on the lower left hand side of the speaker. Each of those points represents in blue for North America and red for Eurasia, where we have detailed biomass data destructively collected in a given year, and the coincident satellite data from our GEMS NDVI data set was an eight long data set. And so we noticed that they hold together very well. So this enables us then to take data where we don't have calibration data, use this relationship, and extrapolate. And that's what we do. So through from 1982 to 2010, 29 years, we've just added uh, the 30th year of the study. We have overall a 20% increase in the total above ground biomass production in the tundra. Two papers have been published so far on this. One is Epstein et al. Uh, in the RL, and the other is by Marco Reynolds et al. Uh, also in 2012 in the most recent letters. So if you're interested in these two sources, we'll look at this. But the thing is, we have this rather dramatic 20% increase in tundra biomass production over 30 years. So this is what they would look like. This is a figure which Rank and Manini produced, uh, and uh, it shows several things. In green, we have for all of the Arctic, we're looking at the NPBI and how it has increased from 1982 through, uh, through 2011, 2010, I think it's 2011. But what you'll notice is the green, the points increased up to 1991 when Mount Matuba erupted and cooled the northern hemisphere. The Arctic is limited by temperature, so biomass production and the immediate decrease. As you see, fell off, the climate system reset, and then things continued on up to the present. Now, anytime we do any studies, we always compare things to MODIS data and the spot vegetation data to make sure different data sets. 
same result. This is called a blue thing on the right hand side of the upper curve for this Arctic area. It's a, it's a direct comparison of motor data from exactly the same area, and they agree very well. The slightly lower down on, on the lower center and right hand portion of this figure is a histogram of temperature anomalies and our NDVI, NDVI anomalies from this same area, and you'll notice they agree very well too. It's crucially important to use other types of data to, to understand what you're looking at. Okay, so we had these interesting trends, this 20% increase in tundra biomass production. Now let's look and see what our sea ice trends have found for looking at Arctic sea ice. Now, Arctic sea ice can be measured very, very accurately because at a wavelength of 1.55 centimeters or a frequency of 19 gigahertz, there's a marked spectral emissivity difference between sea ice, which has a spectral emissivity of 0.8 to 1, and ocean uh, liquid water, which has a spectral emissivity at a wavelength of about 0.4. So it's it, it is really, really easy to measure and distinguish sea ice from open ocean water. Now, I show this because I like to tease graduate students and, uh, and, and undergraduate students. This is how we put our, or how the sea ice people put our graduate students and undergraduate students to work. And I think by doing this work, just like my work with flipping, makes you realize there are better ways of doing it. Uh, <laughs> this is kind of a gag photograph. Anyway, so the sea ice data show, just like our Arctic tundra data showed this increase over time, uh, the Arctic sea ice data, these, here we're looking at the, at the yearly minima of the Arctic sea ice extent. And you'll see it has the opposite slope because temperature is affecting both. In the case of Arctic sea ice, it's melting it. In the case of the tundra vegetation, it's warmer, so it's growing more. So once again, in remote sensing now, we have a lot of different data types we can look at. See, uh, uh, we can look at one phenomena with one, a different phenomena with some other types of data, and then compare them. Now, I give a lot of talks about climate. Now, unfortunately, the local boss is now coming on with their call to prayer, and I'm not sure if you can hear it in the back. Yeah. <laughs> so, whenever that happens, it's... Uh, it's F.S. Pilsner talk. Talk about sea ice. Some of the are saying, well, sea ice, uh, you all who talk about the Arctic all the time, what about the Antarctic? Because sea ice there is increasing. And these are the Antarctic sea ice minimum data, which occurred at the end of the Austral summer uh, in February, which is the minimum. And you'll notice there is a trend over time which is increasing. So what the hell is going on? Well, there are marked differences between the Arctic and the Antarctic. The Arctic is an ocean surrounded by land for the most part, and the Antarctic is, uh, it is, it is, is a continent surrounded by ocean. So they're very, very different. So how can we resolve this difference? Well, let's look at the gravity data. These are new data which are revolutionizing our understanding of ice sheets, uh, aquifers, and so uh, I want to show some, some, some gravity data from the Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment. This is an experimental German NASA mission. Uh, it has a baseline of 220 kilometers, two satellites from the same orbit, with very, very accurate, accurate, accurate range between them to uh, 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 plus or minus one one thousandth of a millimeter. And so what you measure is variations in mass on the surface as these two satellites come along. When one satellite comes on an increasing mass, it will speed up you know, to what's happened before. The distance between them will increase, or if you get a mass loss, and then uh, there will be uh, uh, just the opposite will happen. So from these data, and the distances between these satellites at a 220 kilometer uh, spacing, you can see what is happening, the variations in mass and mass units directly on the surface. So you can use these data to study what's happening to ice sheets, and in, in particular, I want to compare what's happening to Greenland and what's happening to Antarctica in terms of mass variations. The left-hand side 
at the newspaper, this figure from Scott Lepke and uh, Dave Rogan's Ballard Space Flight Center, you see a mass loss in Greenland during the summer, a mass increase in the winter, a mass loss in the next summer, so on like this. So over uh, uh, these 800 years of, of grace data, from Greenland you have about a 1,200 gig uh, mass loss. That's about 1,500 gig kilometers, that's like 10 cubic miles. And that by itself has contributed 3.4 millimeters to the sea level loss. But let's look at air too. There is a figure with clips, the top curve in blue is Greenland. The middle curve is from Antarctica, and the lower curve is from the Gulf of Alaska. So in all cases, you see that Greenland is losing ice mass, and so is Antarctica. So all of this nonsense about, well, the Antarctic sea ice show that Antarctica is getting colder. No, Antarctica is getting warmer, and it's losing mass, and it's losing mass, and it's accelerating with it. You can see here. You know, gains mass in the Austral winter, loses mass in the Austral summer, but the curve is clearly, the curve to river is clearly negative. Uh, you also see below them what's happening in the Gulf of Alaska, where you also have mass loss. So here we started off looking at photosynthesis in the tundra. We got one result. Then we looked at the sea ice data, which agreed with what we saw there. But then people said, well, what about the Antarctic sea ice? So now we go to gravity data, and now we bring conformity uh, and see that synchronous warming is happening to our planet in terms of ice in all these locations. Now, it's always good to, sh to show our humanist friends uh, that, uh, that we in science are also interested in poetry. And this is a poem about, na about nature's best thermometer from Henry Pollock. He's written a, a very interesting book called The World Without Ice about the cryosphere. Uh, because nature's best thermometer is probably ice. Uh, because the earth warms, ice is going to melt. If the earth cools, we will have an expansion of ice. So ice asks no questions, presents no arguments, reads no newspapers, listens to no debates. It is not burdened by ideology. It carries no critical baggage. It changes from solid to liquid. It just melts. So I use this in all of my global warming talk. Now, here's a figure which I just received uh, uh, several hours ago uh, from Rangel Manini and his group, taking our new data set, which we're now starting to beta test, which runs from, uh, from July of 1981 through December of 2011. Jorge Pinzlot is the person who put this data set together and calibrated for them. But now we're able to look at 30 years of global satellite data albeit at an 8 kilometer spatial resolution, and it starts to see how things are changing. But again, anytime we use these data that are present being beta tested, you have to compare them to the modus data for the corresponding periods. So this is one example of how my work, which started off, uh, I was trying to escape from working in a bank, and then in a graduate program, using hyperspectral data, which then moved into the time domain, and then jump to, to satellite data. In the process, I've had the opportunity to work with a lot of very clever uh, friends and colleagues. There's a lot of work to be done, and uh, uh, it's very important to continue this work. 30 years of data are great, uh, 40 years would be better. Now, it's important because all the data sets I showed that I've shown are really useful to address climate uh, and of course, climate is determined by the global energy balance. And photosynthesis and carbon cycle are very important. Uh, I personally feel uh, through cosmic good fortune, the Earth has retained water in the base for billions of years. We're just damn lucky that we have a planet at a certain mass, a certain distance from a certain type of star or sun. Uh, but climate sensitivity uh, can be forced very easily, one way or the other. And so this is why we have to be very careful about our use of fossil fuels. So uh, when I teach at the University of Maryland, although I haven't taught in several years, I try and sort of do different things. And I came across what I call the most sensing creed, that uh, I want to understand the life on our planet. I don't want to be limited by our eyes or our sensory system that's optimized for a 58, 80 Kelvin star, 93 million miles away. Okay. So therefore, I have to use the electromagnetic spectrum. This is what we do in remote sensing. And uh, uh, there's a lot of fun, there's a lot of work to be done. There are many impressive personal science questions for students to work on. 
and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dan. Any, any questions? Yeah. Okay. Hi. I did have one question with regards to the uh, slide you were showing with the Antarctic sea ice, the uh, at, you know the subtle increasing trend there in your graph. I couldn't help but notice too that the variability was increasing pretty drastically as time went on. Do you have any thoughts on what's driving that? Uh, no, I don't. It is directly related to ocean circulation in the Southern Ocean. Uh, and uh, I could make the argument that the trend is overwhelmed by the variation. So uh, it's not something I would bet on. If you look at the slope, 2.6% 2, 2. Um, over a decade, plus or minus 4.4%. So you can actually yeah. say, statistically, this is inconclusive and we need more data. And that's what I think. It's yeah. just a very noisy system because of the interaction of, of the Southern Ocean with the ice sheets. I totally agree. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Okay. What are you doing in Turkey? <laughs> uh, well, what I'm doing in Turkey, I'm going to turn this up slightly, maybe you can see that, or well, you can't. Uh, what I'm doing, NASA has a program in space archaeology. And uh, you're not studying the archaeology of things from outer space or or the Apollo program, things like that. Uh, but you're taking NASA tools and uh, techniques and data and applying them to archaeology. And so I'm at the site of Gordian in central Anatolia, in central Turkey, and uh, we're performing geophysical surveys of areas. We've also reconstructed using the Landsat data in the past 40 years the land use history around the site of Gordian. Gordian is the site where Alexander the Great in 333 BC cut the Gordian knot for his sword. It was this knot which no one could untie, and the and the legend associated with it was the person who could untie the Gordian knot would become the ruler of Asia. So Alexander comes here with the Macedonians in 333 BC. They were fighting against the Persians. They come to Gordian. The town uh, didn't resist, so he came peaceably. And when they showed him the knot, he said, this is no problem. He had a very sharp Macedonian sword. So he just whacked it with his sword and cut the Gordian knot and then became the ruler of Asia, at least for a while. So I'm here as part of the University of Pennsylvania team doing geophysical surveys. Hi, Jim. Um, this is Jennifer Dungan. Um, we have a question from your friend John Paul Malengro who's joined us on the internet. He says, most significant land cover changes are taking place in agriculture and tropical forests. Can you say a word on your work in those areas? Uh, yes. Uh, well, right now, especially the tropical seasonal and tropical dry forests seem to be being converted to agriculture at, at a very rapid rate. Principally for biofuels, I think that's driving a lot of oil palm, for example. Um, and with satellite data, we can follow this year to year. And uh, it's extremely important for us to conserve tropical forests for two reasons. One is climate, because of all the carbon they contain. But it's equally as crucial because of biological diversity of all the species that live there. So fortunately, there are some people who have taken what, what Jean and I have worked on before on tropical forests and very current, people like Matt Hansen uh, and others, that with satellite data now, we can follow this globally year by year and bring pressure to bear on areas where, where clearance uh, is illegal or is prohibited. Uh, but it's one of the many uses of satellite data, and this work is vitally important. Other questions in the room? I see a question from Rango. Yep. Uh, it, said, it says, Jim, looking back, do you sometimes wonder how your idea has morphed into a whole new deal of science? Um, well, yes, Rango. I, I feel that I, that 
I feel similar to the story you hear about someone who's asleep on the, on the turnip wagon in the Middle Ages as you're going through a village and you get a bump and you fall off and you end up in a really nice village. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it surprised me. I never thought something like this would happen. I was just really curious to see if you could use the HR data. And then we had to figure out how to recalibrate the data. Uh, of course, you can do things much better from MODIS, but with MODIS, you only have 10 or 11 years versus 30 years of data from the same instruments, from the drone to the same instrument. Mm -hmm. problem. And it's, uh, yeah, I think he's just it, it, away. it's always disconcerting uh, in some ways, but encouraging in others. If you see the students coming along, we train this little frog over you and then go on to, to uh, do better and better things with the data. So, once again, it's been a pleasure to work with this data to provide to other people. And uh, we will be releasing this set to everyone probably in about six months after we find many of the problems associated with it. So, Jim, are there any plans to continue the AVHR uh, sensors themselves into the future? Well, uh, we think we may get five more years out of it because uh, NOAA transferred its last three AVHRs to uh, the unit set for their METOPS polar uh, meteorological sensors. And they're providing global one kilometer data now. Uh, it's unfortunate that uh, NOAA didn't do this, but uh, METOPS people are providing global one kilometer data right now. So we think they will get for. Uh, the next four or five years, and hopefully five years from now, we'll have a 35 year old so from the same instrument. Uh, someone in the chat room asks how do trends in AVHRR compare with trends in MODIS over other biomes, especially more heterogeneous ones such as mixed forests? Well, that's a good question because you're comparing, uh, well, we don't know, but that's what we're looking at right now. And so, if you, if, you, if you perform these analyses and you perform them, uh, taking into account spatial differences, uh, differences in spatial resolution, and the techniques you have to use to compare apples to apples, I suspect they would be the same. I'll, I'll be extremely surprised if they're not the same. But you have to perform those tests uh, correctly. For example, the uncertainty in terms of geolocation of our data plus or minus one pixel. So we're talking about eight kilometer data. That's something on the order of uh, 24 by 24 kilometers. So you would need to make that comparison at that scale of most data to be sure you're comparing the same areas on the ground. I have a question. If we can go back on the slides to the global sure. MBBI average. Okay. Yeah, that looks really interesting. Uh, I'm going the wrong way. Hold on one second. The 30-year average data set. Yeah, I was, I was trying. I was trying to find it. Let me. Maybe it's further back. Let me go forward. Was that toward the yeah, end? There, there, there. Sorry about that. Uh, Jim, uh, I was wondering. Uh, I was always peering over these average. Uh, uh, images of average NDVI because there is so much information here and we've been looking at these figures for years now and last night when I was looking at this figure I see um, here in, in Oceania you see the tip of Australia and above it I think it's Papua New Guinea maybe mm -hmm. and it's yeah. amazing how, how spatially close they are but in Papua New Guinea, it, it, it's tropical forest, and just maybe a few hundred kilometers south in Australia, it's less green. I was puzzled about it. Well, that's always puzzled me too, Rango. Huh. In Australia, where you have a tropical forest, it's only on the extreme eastern part of the country, and actually right. in the northeastern part of Australia on the coast. Uh, but yes, that is. Uh, 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 very curious. It's also really interesting for me. I was studying this, and uh, when we started making these measurements, or when we started producing images like this from one or two years of data, there were a lot of people who told me that I was completely stupid for trying to use 
uh, one and four kilometer data to study anything about the land surface. Uh, I think some very good apologists who I won't mention their names, uh, but uh, we're really silly. Uh, but I think when you see an image like this, and when you can look at areas, immediately many questions like you have just elucidated, uh, expressed frankly, come to mind, and you can focus your attention on, well, let's look at these areas. What are the reasons for this? How do the climate data look for these regions? What are the differences? What is the atmospheric circulation? And all kinds of other information is brought up there. See, what's the reason for this? But I've come to believe very strongly in the accuracy of the vast majority of the more sense data. And instead of thinking, well, maybe we did something wrong, instead, then it lets them look very carefully by them, because it looks really, really interesting. I agree. So, so Mao Sheng asks, what uh, what cautions should we take when using NDVI? What what do you think the limitations are? Well, okay. Uh, thank you, Mao Sheng, for asking this because I get extremely irritated. People say, "Well, the NDVI saturates." We know that the NDVI is directly related to the absorption. Uh, of, of the MFR by plant candidates. So, and the reason that it, that it, it, it toads is because there, there is no more absorption because all of the visible flux, for the most part, say 95, 96 percent of it, has been absorbed by green leaves. So, it actually reports very accurately what's happening in the canopy. If you want to use another index, like the so called enhanced vegetation index, then you take the terms that you multiply them so you weight the mirror. Heavily, but then you no longer have an index which is related to APOC. You have an index which is, which is more heavily related to the density of green leaves, perhaps LAI or something like this. So, uh, if you're, my caution would be if you're using NPDI data, realize first and foremost that they are related to, to, to APAR, to therapy absorption, as many studies have shown, and don't try and use them for something that helps. Jim, over the years, I'm sure uh, you have seen hundreds of papers uh, written using your data set. Do you have any you know, study in mind that took you completely by surprise? Oh. Hmm. <laughs> That's a good question. I'm, I'm sure there were. Uh, uh, people have done some very clever things with it. Um, I don't like Sarah Palin. Uh, I can't think of what the papers were, even though I've read them. <laughs> Marta asks, could um, Andy... Hmm. Oh, no. <laughs> I still think. No, I, I actually, um, um, well, there have been several papers where the creativity of people to use the data in ways uh, uh, has really surprised me and also encouraged me. But, but, but there have been several, uh, especially in some of the areas where the data you know, have been linked or have been used to draw down certain models and represent land service conditions. That's one area where I'm very encouraged and I was very surprised, uh, although when you think about it, it seems very logical. Now, I see also Marta has asked a question, but any effects changes because the leaf water content changes? Yes, you can use NPVI data to study a drought cost. And of course, in the drought, you have less, you have less water available for leaves because you, you then lose your portable density in uh, uh, the areas which are the water available. Um, and so that's one way where NPVI data reflect drought conditions. There is a there is a fascinating article by Hans Tomovic and others very recently in Nature Climate Change where they used uh, NDVI data to monitor the population of lemmings and lemmings are small rodents with a big temperament and in some years they lay waste to so much vegetation that the devastation can be seen from space. 
<laughs> so this paper came out in Nature Climate Change um, by our colleagues in uh, Fenoscandia, Hans Tomawick, Terry Callahan, Johan Olofsson, and others. So that, that, that is surprising. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's great. <laughs> that's wonderful. Yes. Uh, I would agree, Rango. It, it's very surprising, and uh, I'll, I'll have to read that, but uh, uh, it seems like a very interesting use of NDVI data. <laughs> <laughs> that they can be monitored from space. Yeah. yeah. There is something similar in the Yellowstone, where yes. where the bisons actually graze the, so they actually stand in a row, so they, they actually in the graze, you know, from day to day. You can see they change in NDVI. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like a lawnmower, you know? Just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a very big lawnmower. But one of the things, to answer your question, uh, Aroma, I, I, I was very surprised to read that the USDA had put up insurance to <coughs> me. Uh, and it was based on NDVI data. And then it's run out of uh, the data from the USDA Center. But when I saw that, the NDVI data will be used in, the, in some insurance uh, sense or, or, or purpose. I was, I was extremely surprised by that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Jean. There's another uh, question that popped up um, about NDVI as a proxy of tree fraction, leaf area, and roughness. And uh, did you do you have any cautions about that? Uh, that's something which I'm not knowledgeable about. It's too bad that your sellers is not here because he can certainly talk about that in, in detail. Uh, Anytime you use data, you have to be careful of what you're doing is appropriate for data. And uh, I've never thought about roughness, uh, and especially tree roughness, with uh, respect to vegetation indices. So I'm going to plead ignorance and understand that. Okay. okay. Well, with that, we'd really like to, to thank you, Jim, for joining us all the way from Turkey. It's been a real pleasure. You're welcome.